How you doing today? We are live. So we're doing our hangout today. Uh, give me a, a chat. Give me a chat room shout. Let me know that you guys can hear me and that everything is cool. My chats. Ch -ch chat. Boy, this is confusing. Okay. I see some of you there. See Deanna and Luis and Mary and Anne and Jagjit. You probably J A G J I. I thought maybe for a second you just typed that in real fast. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? Am I coming in live? Am I coming in loud? Hello. Turning it off, turning it on. You gotta give me some feedback. Let me know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awkward. <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure if I should just go for it or what. I'm in the room, started the broadcast, we are live, please, you know what, maybe I've disabled the chat or something. Nope. Can you hear me? I'm talking, um, blabbity blab blabbing, wondering if it is even working. Am I getting through? This is Major Tom to ground control. No. Yes. Oh, thank you. All right. That's all I needed was just a little love there. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Jagjit. Jagjit. So we're going to have a chat today, and I hope I, I love it that you guys keep showing up for this. Um, when I first had the ID and I started doing it, um, I didn't think it'd catch on. I figured people would just brush it off or blow it off or whatever. So um, let me tell you a little bit about my day here to put to kind of frame all of this and put it into perspective. Oh, you're on a mobile. You type, Jack just typed on a mobile. That's why it's so crazy. What's your name, Jack Jet? Um, so I've been awake f working on a project now for 15 hours, and I did this to you guys last week too. I had been awake for a while, but I mean that didn't hinder anything. We went crazy, didn't we? Um, I did another webinar earlier today, and I spent hours just in the the um, like I guess production side of it the development stuff um, so I ran that at noon and it went on for over an hour or so and I got some time to eat so I could run on up to hang out with you guys I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna be a little bit shorter today um, I'm not against going long in fact I really really like that it's a lot of fun but today has been a taxing day on my family, really. I got my boys, and they are dying to go and do something and hang out. So we're going to – we're going to – oh, Jagjit is your name. <laughs> I thought maybe since you're on your mobile phone, the typing thing made, made it go quirky or something. I've never met Jagjit before, and I'm probably – probably am not pronouncing that correctly. It's – uh, I'm probably butchering that, so please forgive me if if that's the case, which I'm sure it is, so forgive me. <laughs> Interesting, I did a webinar on forgiveness today. Okay, um, 
let's get into our topic, which I can't even remember what it was. My brain has, there's so many topics and things I wanted to do, and I've been everywhere. So today was called The Etheric Doorway and the Immortal Jellyfish. Um, well, today this one is just going to go on for a little while. And it looks like you raised your hand. Maybe you want to talk. That's super cool. If any of you guys ever want to jump on and talk, just raise your hand. There's a button there for you to do that. I'm going to go ahead and invite you to come on. So you have to um, fish, <laughs> jellyfish and etheric stuff. You're going to have to uh, go ahead and you know accept the permissions to do that. And then when you come on, be part of the group here but um there was a lot of foundational things the reason i say that is because like i wanted to talk about this concept of the etheric doorway and it's just it's one of those things that when it's when you you know i'm saying me but you know you or anyone when you have an idea or a concept in your head it kind of makes sense until you have to verbalize it and you have to say what it is and then it gets a little tougher and you have to really understand it and you have to really know it and you have to really, you know, rah, you gotta get into it. So um, I did not really, it was not a priority of mine this week to spend as much time diving into that. But that doesn't mean that we're not gonna have some fun today anyway because I'm gonna go through some of the foundational parts, the sort of setup for that and then maybe we'll do that next week, or maybe I'll make you another extra video or something if I get a wild hair or something. Um, and we can have a lot of fun with that too. So uh, before I jump in, I wanted to say something to you guys. You're, you're kind of a core part of the group. You know, you enjoy these things and you, you've been coming back. I mean, we've only done three of them now, but um, I'm going to keep doing these. So I'm going to have a normal thing on Saturdays unless I. You know, absolutely can't be here for some reason. I mean, I still should be able to pre-record one and then play it for you. Um, I want this to be a regular thing. And like I did a webinar earlier today, and I didn't tell you about it because it was a promotional thing. You know, I was promoting stuff, and I was selling a course of mine at the end of it, uh, which is cool. I don't, you know, feel bad about that. But I kind of want to keep the the selling things to a minimum, I guess. Um, that's not the best way to say that, but um, I, I want this to be an arena over the next few months for us to get to know each other. It's like a playground. We're going to have fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. Hey, check this out too. Um, I got my, my bookshelves set up, so I'm really excited about that. No more like digging books out of boxes and crap like that. Um, I just know right where they are. It's been awesome this week. I like have an idea. I go right to the bookshelf. I pull it. I, you know, all of these books that I've gone through, I've made notes in the back of end of them with a little page number and like a one or two sentence. So if it's a concept and I know what book it's in, I just go to the shelf, grab it, pop it open, and then I run through it and I go, oh yeah, oh yeah. It's like um, it's like an old friend or something. You know, the first time you meet somebody. You don't know everything about them. You just like meet at a party and you guys have a, a drink and then you talk about, I don't know, work or your family and maybe it lasts 10 minutes or so and then you, boom, you're on to the next thing or next person that you meet. Um, that's the way these books are. I don't try and just sit down and like get every single thing out of a book. I sit with it, kind of flip through it. I look at the table of contents read the front, read the back, and then I go to the parts that I think are interesting. Uh, I've found just from reading enough books that most of them have a few good points. I mean, some of them are packed full of stuff, so, you know, not to say that they're not. Like, like for example, a textbook is just condensed information, but most books have two points, three points, and then they like just fill up a lot of space. And I think that it's a sales, you know, approach that you have to fill up the pages so that you can sell the book. You know, nobody wants to buy a four page book. 
even though all of the information could be like in four pages. Um, sorry, totally on a rabbit trail there. So tonight, today, not tonight, it's daytime, obviously, and the sun is still shining on me. Um, we're going to do, we're going to go in the direction of the etheric doorway, and I'm going to set up some foundation, and then I'm totally going to tease you about this a little bit, because it's wicked cool. Like, I, I mean, I'm serious, like right now, I feel, you know how when you like say something, or you hear a poem, or you know, your hair stands up, and my, my eyes are watering right now, I'm like thinking about how how heavy how how heavy this is it's like trans it's transformational i'm trying to find another word that wasn't so cheesy but this is about the sort of line in the sand that we draw between our physical world and our energetic world our electrical world and our magnetic world our positive and our negative our yin and our yang our you know matter and etheric it's energy and you know it's light and then it's frozen light it's like these two things that or two characteristics that exist simultaneously inside of one thing maybe that's where this comes from like well um, it's like uniting those worlds i just totally made that up but I'm, i mean make it up i that boom just Got that right now. You saw it happen live. <laughs> so let me just peek at this real quick. Let's see. Who did we lose? One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Lost somebody. Forgive me for that pause there. So let us begin. I really want to, for our discussion, to start around the topic of what we call a hologram. And really what I'm going to build up to is the holographic nature of our universe and of the world that we live in because it's holographic. I mean, I don't care what you think. Uh, you can't argue. It's very, very, very unitarian like the the one is the many is in the one like the tiniest part contains the information of everything so let's talk about that for a little bit and um maybe i can even pull up some images for you to look at uh, because i want to go into this idea of how a hologram is created and if you don't know how this looks then you might really appreciate this or you might be bored with it i don't know um okay good here's one this one is very simple so i'm going to pull this picture up and i'm going to come back here and share the screen with you so that you can see it okay and it's in the corner here Wish I could pull it over or something, but um, basically you, you can kind of reference this picture while I talk, okay? Because I'm going to explain to you how a hologram is made. Like what up with that? What's a hologram? Well, first you have to start with what's called coherent light. So coherent light is basically, I'm going to steal the screen here. If... Um, light were to act in a way that you know here's the wavelength of light if you have all of these beams of light that all fall in order together they all match up together oops i screwed up there they don't bump they don't touch they just all are uniform and unison together it's kind of like soldiers marching or something this is called coherent light Whereas if it's incoherent light, here's a wavelength, and here's a wavelength, and here's a wavelength, and they just all, it's like a circus, and then they just bang and bump each other, and they knock the crud out of each other. So what laser really is, is a way to organize the wavelengths of light that are generated from the laser. So it's, it's called coherent 
light, which is basically what a laser is. So you need to understand first that in order for this to work, we start with coherent light. We got all these soldiers marching together. Um, so you fire the light, and what happens is there is um, a in this image they call it a half mirror. It's like a beam splitter. So it takes one part of the beam and it shoots it one way, and the other part shoots the other way. And that's you know as simple as you can make it. Um, and then you see that they hit these mirrors, and the mirrors make them sort of come back together at um, what the point of this picture that's called the hologram. So one of them is made, it's split, and it bounces off a mirror, and it, um, and it hits the photographic plate. So, yeah, I mean, technically in this example, the hologram, what they're calling a hologram, is really captured on a photographic plate. So right there, the very top beam that shoots across and then hits the top of, they call it the object beam here. Um, one, of, one of them is a reference beam, one of them is an object beam. So basically one of them hits the photographic plate and never touches the object. That's all you really need to know. One of them never touches the object and only hits the photographic plate. The other beam that was split now hits the object so here's what's, this is the part that's insane, okay? This is crazy. Um, I can't say that I 100% understand it, but it's about an interference pattern because when the, the reference beam and then the object beam, when they hit each other from different directions, remember they used to be coherent light working together, they create what is called an interference pattern. And if you remember this from our quantum physics talk, interference pattern is like when you throw two rocks in the water. Here's some great pictures of it. So if I throw two rocks into the water and they start to create rings that splash out, boy, that's making my eyes hurt. Let me get away from that picture. <laughs> Boom. Sorry, I was looking at the chat thing. Um, where's a different picture than this psychedelic one? Like this. This is basically what happens. If um, you throw two rocks into a pond at the same time, they make these concentric circles that go out in directions. And when those two circle patterns hit each other, they interfere and cause this interference wave pattern. So the reason I'm showing you this is because when the when the uh, interference pattern, there's the, the working beam or the object beam and the reference beam, they bounce off something, and then when they hit each other, they generate a third pattern. It's an interference pattern, and the interference pattern is what's recorded onto the photographic plate, okay? So if, you, if I just confuse the crap out of you with all of that stuff, don't worry, all you need to really understand is that these two, this beam of light is split, one of them goes towards the photographic plate, the other one bounces off and hits an object, and the patterns of light that bounce off of it interfere with this other beam, and the new third wavelength, or the interference pattern that's created from that is what's recorded onto and creates the hologram, okay? So go, I mean, even if you didn't get all that, go with me on this, okay? Because I wanted to just talk a little bit about how you make a hologram because holograms are tripped out. And this is why I say this. If I took my phone, okay, and I cut it up into 10 different pieces and I just held one of them up, it wouldn't look like a tiny phone. It would just be one little part of my phone. But it's not how it works in the holograph world. If I take, let's say we took a holographic picture of an apple. Okay, so not only when we shine coherent light at that photographic plate now, does the picture of the apple appear, 
they won't it won't appear with just regular light like you're you know in the ceiling here this incoherent incandescent type of light it won't work you need another reference beam and it's like it's it's as if the image of the apple is encoded inside of that it's like it generates the working beam so that when uh, i shine coherent light at the photographic plate i see an apple and i see it in three dimensions like some holograms you can walk around them and underneath them and above them and you can see every three-dimensional part of it so uh, it's a picture that is truly in three dimensions the here's the part though that i'm the really makes me go Bleh. if i take that picture of the apple the holographic apple and i cut it up with scissors and i cut it into 70 pieces and i take one tiny little piece of that and i shine the light at it i will see an entire apple it will be tiny it will be smaller but it will be the whole thing okay it'll be the whole damn thing that is crazy what it in essence is showing and this is where i'm going to sort of take a jump and applying it into the conversation that we like to have about you know our biology and our energetic field and our living systems is that um, in nature this exists all the time it's like in our cells we have dna the dna is like the tiny little part but it contains all of the information to make everything so an entire human being can be made from the information that's in one cell in one strand of dna and I want to talk about this a little bit here, um, but I want to. But before I jump to that, I just want to kind of tie up around the idea that when you cut up a hologram, it's not a bunch of pieces of the picture. Like, it, like if you cut up my phone, it's a bunch of pieces of the phone. What you end up with is a bunch of tiny versions of the whole. So it, it basically is what science is saying to us through that experiment is that the information that makes up everything is encoded in the tiniest pieces of it how about that <laughs> how about them apples <laughs> that's there's some food for thought boy that's i got a lot of puns going there <laughs> okay so let me let me talk a bit about this idea of DNA because it's a great analogy. It's a great bridge between these sort of energetic wavelength type of experiments and even you know scientific experiments showing how hol holograms work. Uh, let's take it to our physical body and to our DNA. So I'm going to use an analogy here and I want you to imagine or, or let me just even sorry let me turn this off. Before I have you imagine this idea, I'm going to pose this question to you. And DNA explains a lot of things. It explains how these cells can become bones, and these are muscles, and these are tissue, you know, sinew, and these are joints, fluid, and, you know, all of the different cellular types that make up the, the structure of the organs and the systems and the tissues and you know, the hierarchy of everything, they all come from the very one cell. You know, here's a sperm, here's an egg, they get together, they do the dance, you're one cell. And then you become two, and then you become four, and you become eight, and then you become 16, and then you become 32, and 64, and la, 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 la. So the, the, the model and the understanding, the sort of theory of DNA and the gene it gives us a great explanation of how those cells, how do how they do that, you know, like all the information is in there. And so the information to be a heart cell is in there and the information to be an intestinal wall cell and a toenail and, you know, X, Y, Z. What it's missing though, and this is the really the point of this conversation. This is the question I'm posing to you. 
how do those cells know where to go? So in a spatial type of organization, yeah, the DNA says you're a bone cell, but how do you know to travel to the head of the femur and fit right into the acetabulum, right? Like the socket and the joint that happens there is not to chance. Like everything, how do those cells know to go out and make and organize and coexist and talk to each other almost like you would manage you know in an office you have a manager and these employees the manager sees the big picture the employees are focused on their task so if all these cells are you know differentiating to do their specific task who's the manager right <laughs> who is the one overseeing all of it so i'm going to put this into this analogy here and I got this analogy out of um, Gerber's book, Vibrational Medicine, just because it's very elegant. And I definitely want to give credit to him for it. And it, here's the idea. We're going to use Little League Baseball Team. So let's say we take a bunch of kids, and they're smart. You know, They know how to read, and they can comprehend, and they have critical thinking. And we teach, we take them, and we say, we're going to teach you guys to play baseball. And they say, we've never played baseball before. Okay, don't worry. I have a manual for you. And you really, you only have one assignment on the team. You're either the first baseman or the second base or the third base. You're the catcher. You're the pitcher. You're the shortstop. You know, you're the outfield, center, left, right. So there are defined roles just the way cells differentiate into specific roles that they play. Same thing on a baseball team. You don't have to know how to do everything else. But here's what here's how they learn, okay? We give them a book. We give them a manual called How to Play Baseball. And it's like this thick. It's just a monster book. And their kids, they're like, well, I don't have a – I can't read that whole book. Like My attention span is only this big. So we tell them it's okay because what we've done is we've – blacked out we've put black construction paper on top of all of the pages that are extraneous and you don't have to know them so there's only about 30 pages in this entire book that are pertinent to you and the position that you're going to play on the baseball team so the kids all go oh, okay i can i can do that i can learn that so even though they have access to all the information most of it is blacked out except for their specific role and what they're supposed to play Okay, so this is the same exact way our cells work. Our cells are all individual players trying to do specialized differentiated functions in our body. And they have a manual that tells them how to do everything. So instead of being able, to, instead of having to like do it all, they have several pages in their manual blacked out. You know, there's black construction paper on those. And those are these are proteins on top of the DNA that are called histones. And the, the proteins essentially cover up the DNA so it can't be reached. So the parts that are unnecessary and not needed for that cell's function, you just don't use them. You can't reach them. Uh, which is interesting, a side note, when they did a human genome project, and they studied all this DNA, and they're like, the human gene is so superior and so complicated that we expect to find, you know, some crazy number. And I'm, I'll butcher the number, so don't quote me, but they were like, we're going to find 500,000 different gene expressions and combinations, and they ended up finding like 15,000, which just blew their mind. It Of their mind. They took the DNA and then they took all of the protein coverings that were on top of the DNA and ripped these off and threw them away. They said, we don't need this. This is junk. We're going to study this part here. So they threw away half of the DNA in their experiment. Um, so, of course, you know, you don't, it almost seems like they were trying to find what they wanted to find. Um, but this pioneered the whole science of epigenetics and how the environment removes those histones or places them back on, meaning that the, the cues that we get from the environment, whether they're intense and physical or whether they're subtle and energetic, 
turn on and turn off the expression of the gene. So the gene really, it's not like you're born with some gene and you're doomed to have it forever, but you influence that, you really do. And this is one of the conversations I love about the power of your mind and your thinking how it influences your body, your physical reality, like not only just your health, but your ability to broadcast and connect with like-minded people, places, stuff that resonate and bring to you all of the goods and all the, you know, the goodies that you want in life. So the reason that um, I'm bringing up this baseball example is because all of those kids can go and learn how to do their specialized task, right? Just like a cell would. But here's the, here's the problem, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago. Those players, they don't know how to go out onto the field and organize themselves spatially. They, they don't have the concept. They know what their goal is and what they're supposed to do but they don't know how to organize themselves respectively to each other in the space that they occupy. So when they go out onto the field, all right, onto the baseball field, you know, the energetic field, the field is like the template for them, okay? They know their role and they know what to do, and it happens inside of this field. The field, like, contains all of it. And the same thing is true for you, for yourselves, and for you, you know, your mind, too, that it's all contained inside of this energetic field. Um, this was the science that was created for things like, if you guys have never gotten into um, Becker or Becker, Robert, Robert Becker, the body electric, fantastic research scientist, super geek, incredible book called The Body Electric. Uh, he's based a lot of his work off of scientists named Burr, B-U-R-R. -R. Was he Robert Burr too? Uh, probably, I, I, I'm remembering him as Robert Burr, but it's probably not. Um, Burr was a research scientist in Yale, and he was like obsessed with understanding the electromagnetic or energetic field around living organisms, and he started with salamanders. And what he postulated was that there was a current present that sort of guided the expression of those cells so they knew where to go. There was something um, in, I'll just say it was an energy field that held the information or the template. It was the field that held spatially together the instructions for all those things to know where to go and to know what to do. So you could take an egg and you could, he did it with um, like little micro pipettes and he put like black ink into the developing embryo. And what he noticed was that all of that ink followed along the central nervous system. So the brain and the spinal cord are like was um, brought into this progression or this flow or this like predetermined march that was happening. Um, Burr, Becker was one, Burr was one, Russian guy named Kurlian. Uh, he was doing his research the same time Burr was, and so it's, they didn't, I don't know that they knew about each other, but it's one of those things that was in the field. Like, if you can just connect with that, let, let me go on a side note here. If you can connect with the field then that way, then you have the potential to access, like, all of the, storehouse of information in the universe. I really believe this. And uh, I'm going to build up to this some more here before we end. The idea of you being able to understand things about our world and our universe and our cosmos and that are beyond our comprehension analytically on a conscious level, that it's not a physical type of understanding, but it's something else. I don't really know that I know the words to explain it. I don't. I wish I did, and I wish I could just tell you. But Curlian was all about studying the, the the field. So he would take these pictures using electrophotography. It was dubbed Curlian photography, and it was something that I don't know. To, I don't understand it totally. I don't really care to either. It's like Corona discharge that. You know, you put a photographic plate between a person and an 
an um, electromagnetic source. And when you fire, there was a discharge and looked like this corona around the sun, whatever. It basically was saying, I'm taking a picture of the energetic field around a living organism. And I've seen some videos of this too, where a guy's sitting at a table and he's eating like fast food and his field is just like, bleh. and the, even the table and the chair are just dull. And then they take that away and they put fruit in front of him. There's like raw living food and he's eating that. And his field just goes, whoa, 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 whoa. And it's, it's incredible. It's, it's trippy is what it is. In the same video, I saw a woman like doing lotus position and doing an alm and breathing. And when she would breathe in, it would go dark. And then she would home and do her, you know, her mantra and like and beams of light that would shoot out. And this was recorded on this film. The same woman, too, when her son came into her presence. It was like the fields went to each other and connected. And when the sun came to her and embraced, you couldn't even see them. It just became bright white light. It's cool. I wish I that I could I wish I still had that. I want to find that and share that with you guys. Okay. Um I'm really all of that was just about building a case that there is a template that exists around you that there is something more than just your physical body you're not just a sack of bones and cells that you know just happen to make arms and legs and the, they grew into like they're secondary they are an expression of something that is primitive that's primary it's the primus it's like the first it's the number one it's the you know, the Omega, or is it Alpha? I, I totally don't know. If you guys know, you can correct me on that. Which one's first, the Alpha, the Omega? I don't know. Anyway, there's this saying, when, and it exists in the world of chiropractic. It says, as above, so below. It's like, in, it says, up, down, inside, out. So it says, we get it from source, it comes down to us, we work through it, and then we express it outward. And all chiropractic philosophy was just about removing interference between you and the power that made you. This is chiropractic. So there's lots of different ways of doing that. They like to, you know, crack your neck and your back. And, you know, a lot of people love that. I, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I, I'm i the crack-free chiropractor. I just never do any of that stuff. But I, I'm trying to... I'm trying to, it's like a metaphysical literature kind of principle, as above, so below. I'm trying to like take it out of the metaphysical world. Maybe that's my own, you know, baggage or something, because um, I, I really, I like the science part of it, but I love the metaphysical part of it too. Um, I think that if you, I've seen videos that do this, okay, so go with me on this journey. It's the universe, and we zoom in, and we see our solar system, and we zoom in, and we see our planet, and we zoom in, and we see our country, and there's a state, and then there's the town, and there's a tree, and then there's a branch on the tree, and then there's a leaf, and then we go down until we get to the atom, and we get to the electron, and we look at it spinning around, and all of a sudden, it looks exactly like it did when we started out here in the universe. With the planets you know revolving around the nucleus or the sun in this example so as above so below or in our uh, principle of holograms the information to build everything the big thing is contained in the smallest part right are you are you with me on that this is the idea here DNA in our body is really just an information manual. It's like an instruction manual. It's got the directions in it. And then it's nothing more than that. And, and shoot, I totally just belittle DNA <laughs> saying it that way. Um, it's not that it's just that. What I'm saying is 
it has its role and it's awesome at what it does, it is not in charge of organizing all of these pieces to move, you know, these cells to be the shoulder and these ones are the neck and these ones are the ear and these ones are the forehead. The spatial organization of all of these tinier parts is governed by some beautiful conductor, like a symphony, like dun, 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 dun. it is it's humbling, it's elegant, it's powerful and subtle at the same time. It's in your face, but it's out of sight. It's this like dilemma, it's this oxymoron that happens for us. Um, it, it's a lot like I taught you guys the double slit experiment, which basically said that electrons act like particles and they act like packets of light or you know beams of light like this one thing contains two characteristics it could be either way this was einstein's entire you know premise that energy and matter were interchangeable e equals mc squared that the energy was equal to the mass times the speed of light squared uh, and this is where I wanted to go with you guys in the next step, okay? And I'm just going to tease you a little bit on it. And we'll, we're going to save it for the next time because it wouldn't it, it wouldn't be cool if I just, like, I'm not prepared to really go into it. Um, so I'll give you the skim over, and then you'll really enjoy a lot more when I have something more to prepare. But it's this idea that in physics... You know, in, in Einstein's equation, like the faster that something went, so as the speed comes up and up and up and up and up, as it approaches the speed of light, you know, if you were looking at a, a XY graph, you know, a Cartesian coordinate graph, and you're looking at it, it's going to, the faster it goes, it's going to faster, 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 and it's going to get as close as it can to the speed of light, but it can never reach the speed of light. It takes too much energy to be inputted into the system to make that mass go fast enough to reach the speed of light. So physicists say if you put numbers into the equation, this was like Einstein Tiller, Einstein Lorentz equation. I think it was Tiller. Anyway. What what I want you to understand is that if you put numbers into the equation that are faster than the speed of light, then you get this negative square, square root of negative one. And that's not a number. It's like it'll make your calculator blow up if you do that. So physicists, they don't like what are called imaginary numbers. And I don't know why. I mean, I had to learn imaginary numbers in freaking out college algebra. So they should, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I don't understand the the, the you know, sticking point. I don't know why they don't like it, but whatever. So the idea here is that when we plug in those imaginary numbers and we work out whatever those equations are or what um, one physicist called hyper numbers, then we begin to have, um, what's the word, an appreciation for the subtleties that exist on the other side of the curtain, okay? So in our Newtonian world of big things, our sort of space-time, I'll call it positive space-time, where we're trying to approach the speed of light, well, there's an opposite to that, you know? I'm Einstein's equal opposite reaction. So there is an, another dimension there, I guess. I mean, I don't want to sound crazy or anything. But the math is showing us that at the same time that this is happening, that is happening. And that we are, um, in, in essence, we're not wearing out and moving faster. We're not approaching the end. We are, we're, we're not entropic. Entropy is this idea that everything in the universe wants to go to chaos. And I sent you guys an email about this the other day. Entropy basically is like always trying to tear everything apart. 
but living systems have this innate intelligence inside of them that stops them from being torn apart. And this is why as soon as you die, you turn back to dust because you don't have that living innate intelligence inside of you anymore to bring order, to organize everything, to bring in food and assemble it into higher organized structures. Um, where was I going with this? This Just this idea here of in a positive space-time world of electromagnetic things we that where we age and get older this world we don't age we get younger we um we go backwards like you remember the movie benjamin button the curious world of benjamin button um things went in the opposite directions it was negative space time so things were in a an opposite entropy things were moving towards order and we see that in place in the energetic, you know, in whatever innate intelligence is that keeps us alive and keeps us in order, you, know, you can't really define it. So I'm saying this begins to open a discussion of a model for what that is, that it is something that is increasing entropy at all times. And almost, in you could make an argument, moving us backward in time. So if we're moving forward in time or we're backward in time, isn't there potentially a way for us to learn to have one foot on each side and equally age and regress at the same pace and live forever and be immortal? You know, obviously, right now the answer is no, but all that means is nobody has figured it out yet. Um, it's like when a medical doctor tells a patient, there's nothing more that can be done for you. I wish they would just say, there's nothing more that I can do for you in my knowledge and scope, but there's probably something that can happen for you. So, you know, don't lose hope. So I'm just saying that we don't, we don't know it all. And just because we haven't been able to do it yet doesn't mean that it can't happen. So um, I was watching a cartoon with my son called the Octonauts, and they're underwater you know, animals, and they help all the sea creatures. And they stumbled on the immortal jellyfish. And I was like, whoa, this is so crazy. I did not know about this. And how perfect you know, the timing was while my brain was in this sort of laboratory of trying to wrap my head around how positive space-time and negative space-time could be increasing chaos and decreasing chaos, how in the Newtonian world of positive space-time, electrical fields were primary, and they generated magnetic fields as a byproduct. And in this world, the magnetic fields were primary. They were first, and because of the direction, the linear alignment of those magnetic fields, they created electrical currents. So here was electromagnetic and here was magnetoelectric. You know, and I'm kind of being semantic here too, but there are just so many subtleties. And I'm not saying that there's one and the other. What I'm saying is they're both. The same way that the electron exhibits the characteristics of both, you know, it's a particle and it's a wavelength it's a beam of light like if it's a beam of light then it means that physical matter is like frozen light it means that you right now your body like touch just touch yourself you know hit yourself in the chest or you know rub your head or like that thing that you're touching is frozen light there was so much potential and energy inside of that i mean this is what atomic bombs are made from. I mean, this is where we began. Well, as soon as we discovered this, then the first thing we did was make a big freaking bomb out of it, which is stupid. <laughs> but I, the, the amount of potential energy, the amount of potential inside of you is you as frozen light with this power, this the subtleties of magnetic electro- impulses that are generated from your mind the the broadcast that you beam out into the world 
it's exciting. It puts you in the driver's seat. You are in control. You are a creator. You know it too. Stand, sit up tall. Be proud of that. You know, puff out a little bit because you are awesome. You are a champion. And everything that you want in your life, you you deserve it. You really do. If you can just align this with it, it's like um, it's like a big magnet, for lack of better words. Like this thing is a magnet, and what these equations are telling us in this subtle world of you know energetic etheric, the etheric doorway, as we sort of go into that world, that it is primarily magnetic. It's magnetoelectric. It's the opposite of this big world that we live in. And so you bet your ass that your mind and your thoughts have magnetism. You bet your ass that you are a powerful creator and that you attract the things that you, you know, tune in your frequency to. It's like tuning your magnet into whatever you want to find, okay? So take that to heart. I want to go deeper into this idea of negative space-time, positive space-time, and the immortal jellyfish. Um, but I'm going to leave it. I'm just going to, I'm going to put it down. I'm going to leave it at that. Because I think that maybe this was enough for today anyway. Isn't that what we were all making our goal when we transcend? I, I'm not sure what you were asking, Pat. But I think that our goal here in the physical world is to raise our vibration as high as we can, but not too high so that we don't poof and transcend everywhere. Um, and th there's a fun conversation about that too. What, what did we come here to do? What did we come here to learn? Like sometimes there's a, a sort of plan. We came here to learn something versus how we influence and attract what we want. So there's the battle. That, that's another fun conversation that we can have. So uh, I am, um, I told you I was going to be short today, so we're running just under an hour here. This is the first time I think I've ever done a talk in under an hour. <laughs> but I just want to make sure there wasn't anything else I was dying to say. Tiny apples. Yeah, I talked about that. All right, see, like, here's my note. Like, this is pretty much just all I write. I just... Scribble some junk, and then uh, there's an hour of lecture right there. Cool. So I'll quit stalling and badgering on. I, I'm going to make a repeat, I guess. Um, I'll name it something different next week, but we'll have our fireside chat. And we're going to go deeper into this concept. So I'm going to show you guys the graph. I'm going to show you the equation. You might not care about it at all, but... I'm telling you, you just you don't have to be an expert in everything. You just have to know enough to um, be able to manage it a little bit. You know, you don't have to know everything about how your car works, but you should know a little bit about it so that when you go in to take your car to the mechanic, you know they don't take you to the cleaners. You 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 should be able to stick your big toe in the water. So I want to I want to. Be your big toe. I won't try and make a toe analogy. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm loopy anyway. I literally worked on this other webinar I did today for about 11 hours straight this morning uh, and then had enough time to go and eat some food before we came. So um, like I said, we're going to hang out every week. Do me a favor, guys. Please... Help me share, you know, spread the word. It's just a small click of us. So, you know, I don't expect you guys to go open the floodgates. But if you know somebody that might dig this, then please do me the honor of referring them to this and send them the webinar registration links and get some people plugged into it. Maybe you might even be the source of something new starting in your community or you know, you might have a little click of people. And I'm really happy to see you guys connect in the chat room and things and email each other outside of this. Uh, it's really an avenue for growth. It says, like, we all have these seeds of, like, 
intention and dreams and things inside of us. And I feel like these conversations are like water and sunshine on those seeds. So please just let yourself, please keep coming to these things. Let yourself just be open. You know, you let your guard down and just receive, period. You know, just receive. There's nothing but love that I have for each and every one of you. And I am going to sign off for now, so I will see you guys next week. Um, send me an email or something if uh, if you if you want. I'd love to hear from you guys, even if it's just to say hey or to say thank you or say a topic or something that you want to do. So, uh, sayonara.